self-pollination, open pollination, complete flowers, incomplete flowers, stigma styles, pollen ovaries. It all sounds a bit risque for us simple gardeners. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we make gardening infinitely less complicated. And today's episode is all about self-pollination. What is it? Why do plants like these peppers do it? How do they do it? And what are the advantages? Time short as always, so let's get into it. The botanical definition of self-pollination in plants is the transfer of pollen from the anther of a flower to one or more stigmas on the same plant. Okay, that's a lot to decipher if you're not up on your biology and plant terminology, so let's break it down. Simply put, anthers and stigmas are just parts of a flower. The anther is the male part, and that's where pollen is formed and distributed, whereas the stigma is the receptive tip of the female part of the flower, and it receives the pollen in higher plants. Great, easy enough. Back to self-pollination. Most of our crops, including these peas here, have more than one flower on the plant. It's how we're able to get so much bounty. But not all flowers are the same, and they're divided into two main types, complete and incomplete. Complete flowers are the whole package. They contain anthers, stigmas, and all the male and female parts in each of their flowers. Incomplete flowers, on the other hand, as you may have guessed, contain only male or female parts. Now, self-pollination isn't picky. It can happen on both complete and incomplete flowers, but it's not as common as you may think. Take these carrot flowers here. Beautiful, complete flowers, but they lack the ability to self-pollinate. Now, self-pollinating makes it seem like our crops do all the work, but very few plants can actually self-pollinate without the aid of specific pollen vectors, i.e. wind or insects. But as a self-pollinator, these particular plants have specific advantages. First, they don't need to produce expensive nectars or smells to attract the pollinators. The genotypes are relatively stable in preferred environments. If resources are scarce, low numbers of flowers can still get the job done and ultimately, they almost never waste pollen. Truly amazing stuff from some of our favorite crops. Know what else might be amazing? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.